Welcome to our third annual um, Northwestern Center for Astrophysics uh, REU Career Panel. My name is Aaron Geller. We have our group of undergraduate students here, and we also have uh, some undergraduate students from other REU programs calling in from across the country, and some that are watching us live on YouTube. Um, thanks for joining us. I hope we have a really interesting discussion today. So um, I'm going to just go through a really quick kind of motivation for why we're having this panel, and then I'm going to open it up to the panelists to introduce themselves, and I'll open it up to um, Q&A. Um, part of the motivation for this is really from my experience and from kind of anecdotally from a lot of people of my generation where, um, you know, we knew that there were different careers out there in astrophysics, but we didn't actually know what they were. And maybe this is one of the ways that we can go about clearing that up and, and having some more information out there that, that everyone can understand. Um, and there was recently a survey done by the American Institute of Physics. It's a longitudinal survey of astronomy graduate students um, and those that graduate with PhDs. So of students that were in a PhD program in 2006 and 2007, and then they followed up in 2014. And this is um, some statistics that I just want to give you, and there's a link on the YouTube page to the full study. But just to set the stage, 83% um, of these students finished with their PhDs. About three quarters went on to a postdoc. Okay, and a postdoc is a research position that you can um, get at a university, for instance, or a lab after you get a PhD. And at 2014, when the survey was taken, about half of these students were still in academia at a university, for instance, as postdoc or faculty. But the other half were at, um, for instance, a federal agency, an observatory, national lab, uh, for-profit, non-profit, government agencies, two-year colleges, just a whole wide range of places. And all of these students had PhDs in astronomy um, and went on to do a whole bunch of different things. So. Um, you know, there was some difference between where people ended up if they had a postdoc. More of them were at a university than those who didn't have a postdoc. Um, most of those who didn't go on for a postdoc were at a for-profit. But regardless of having a postdoc, more than half of these individuals say that they do research in their primary employed position. Okay, so I know a lot of you are very interested in doing research. Uh, and the point there is that it doesn't have to necessarily be in an academic setting. And also, regardless of having a postdoc, uh, more than 85% say that astronomy, their astronomy graduate degree was appropriate background for their current position. So they received the training that they needed, um, and not necessarily to go on and become astronomy faculty, but they received the training that they needed for their jobs uh, and, and were able to be successful. So again, um, you know, there are a bunch of jobs out there, and, and one way that we're trying to introduce that is through panel discussions like this. Uh, and so I just, I, I don't want to take much more time away and I want to hand it right over to the panelists to do uh, sh brief introductions where I'd like panelists, please tell us who you are, uh, where you work, um, and maybe a little background about yourself. And then we'll open it right up to questions from the audience, okay? So let's start with Evgeny. Hey. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so I'm Evgeny. I am engineer at NVIDIA. I did my PhD in astronomy in Amsterdam. Then I spent two years in Northwestern, working side by side with Aaron. Uh, <clears throat> then I decided to leave academia, went back to Amsterdam, where I worked in a supercomputing center, helping academics in physics, chemistry, astronomy, to be able to use supercomputers. And then I moved on further, come back to the United States to join NVIDIA. So that's my background. What the other questions were? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually say, but please say a little bit about what you do uh, day to day. Oh, yeah, so day to day. As usual, I wake up, I walk to work, and I live nearby. And then it's a flexible schedule. I see what needs to be done and just do try to plan the day so that I can have something accomplished during the day. Otherwise, you know, I can get feel depressed if you don't get things done. 
and then go home. Very good. Uh, anything else you want to add? I don't know. Uh, not really. Okay. OK, let's go on. Regina, please tell us a little bit about yourself. OK, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. All right. Hi, I'm Regina. Um, hi, everybody. Good to see all the students. Um, so I'm at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. Um, so I'm actually an REU site director as well. Um, and let's see, a little bit about my background first. Well, actually, um, 20 years ago, I was an REU student, like you all. In fact, I was here at Mariah Mitchell for an REU experience. Um, and it's the reason why I became an astronomer, basically, was my experience here. Um, I have a somewhat non-linear path, though. Um, so that's kind of one potential different thing about my career. I took four years off between undergrad and grad school. Um, I had a fellowship to travel for a year and then um, took off some more time basically before I went to, back to grad school. Um, I went to uh, UC San Diego for my PhD. So I'm an observer. I do observational uh, uh, galaxy formation and evolution studies. Um, and then I did two postdocs. Um, the first postdoc I was in Cambridge, England for three years. And then the second postdoc, um, I had an NSF fellowship that I took to Hawaii. Um, and then I was actually a professor for a year and a half before I just started in this position about a year and a half ago. Um, so I've had a lot of different um, experiences along a very kind of non-linear path, I would say. Um, and let's see, my day-to-day -day work, um, it's like I think many of these kinds of um, research positions, every day is different. So I mostly am doing research here. Um, but during the summertime, of course, I'm running the REU program. And so my main job during the summertime is working with the six undergraduate students that we have here at Mariah Mitchell and um, helping to lead their research projects and helping mentor and organize everything um, involved with that. However, I am also actually at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. We have a very active outreach program. And so we do um, open nights at the observatory for the public. So there's a lot of interacting with the public and trying to explain um, sort of astronomy and astrophysics to the public. Um, so I do, I'm, a, I'm heavily involved in outreach as well. Very good. Thank you. Uh, anything else you want to add? Um, I think that's it for now. I mean, I'm happy to answer questions. OK, thank you. Uh, Jesus, can you give us a little about yourself as well? Uh, sure. Um, so my name is Jesus Pando. My uh, degree is actually my path is actually through physics. So I'm, I actually have a degree in physics, although my area of research is uh, cosmology. Um, I also have, uh, I'm chair of the physics department at DePaul University, so my day-to-day, 75% uh, of some days is full of administrative stuff, which is not a lot of fun. Um, it's important. Um, as a chair, you kind of get a chance perhaps to affect the direction of the department. Um, and on some days, I actually get to spend a lot of time with students and do research. Uh, my path is also very non-linear. I... Um, the first time I went to college after one semester, I got a very nice letter from the university saying that maybe I should pursue other things, um, mostly because I had a 0 0.00 GPA. Um, and then at the age of 35, so some time later, um, I got my undergraduate degree in physics and I've got my PhD at 41. So it's, it's very a very nonlinear uh, as well. Um, I did a postdoc in France uh, at the Observatory de Strasbourg. It was a great time uh, before I got a, a, a chance to get back to the United States and then get into faculty. Um, uh, I'm involved also in a lot of outreach. I'm president of the National Society of Hispanic Physicists. I'm on the American Physical Society's Committee on Minorities. I'm on a working group with the American Physical Society to uh, create a forum on diversity and inclusiveness. Um, and I, um, uh, do a lot of work with SACNAS. If you don't know what that is, ask me. Um, but I, and, I, and I get to do physics and, and astrophysics uh, at the same time. So it's a great, it's been a great career, although I was a very late bloomer. Um, so I, I think with that, I'll stop and wait for people to ask questions. Thank you very much. Leslie, you're next. Please tell us a little about yourself. OK, 
Hey, I'm Leslie Sage. Um, I'm the astronomy editor of Nature and have been for 24 years. I got my PhD at Stony Brook in 87 and then uh, two years postdoc in Socorro and three years at um, Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. And um, then one year as a visiting assistant professor at UNLV and then I joined Nature. And um, as coincidence would have it, 10 days after I accepted the job at Nature, I was offered a 10-year track job. There you go. I decided to stay with Nature and uh, never regretted it. So, um, uh, done some really remarkable things. Um, so I guess, uh, oh, an answer she for me normally starts with about an hour of email in the morning, all the stuff that's come in from um, uh, while, I, while I was asleep from Asia and Australia. And it takes a while to wait through all that. And then normally I'll, I'll see what uh, new manuscripts have come in overnight. <clears throat> have a quick glance through those. And then usually there's some uh, referee reports that are in and I have to make a decision on um, which ones we're moving forward with. And um, so it's a, it's a mix during the day. And uh, that's about all for me, I guess. OK, thank you very much. And Lucien, please tell us a little about yourself as well. Sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Awesome. Um, well, the first thing is that I don't have one of those fancy bars because Google literally told me the app didn't download because there's, quote, something wrong with it. Um, so that's a fun, cool time for me. My name is Lucian Walkowicz, and I'm an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium. Um, I've been here for just about three years. And I had a pretty um, standard academic path, um, although I ended up with a, a fairly unusual job in astronomy. So I was an undergrad in physics. I went to Johns Hopkins, and I went to grad school at University of Washington in Seattle. So I studied physics undergrad and then astronomy for grad school. And after that, um, I did two postdocs. I was at Berkeley for three years and then at Princeton for three years before coming to the Adler. And my, um, my thesis work in grad school and um, my research in undergrad was a lot about uh, stellar magnetic activity, so like flares and sunspots. And um, I became interested about a little over 10 years ago in how stars affect whether planets can be habitable or not. Um, so when I was a postdoc, I worked on the Kepler mission, which is a space telescope that's found a lot of the planets around other stars. Um, so this has been a very exciting uh, past like 10 years for me <laughs> because we've gone from like a couple hundred pan planets to thousands of them. Um, and I also work on uh, something called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is a big telescope that's under construction right now in Chile um, that will m survey the night sky every few nights for 10 years. Um, and even though it's not fully built yet, uh, I've been working on it for about 10 years. Making a big project like that takes a lot of people and a lot of time. Um, so I've been working on that for a long time. And I also now lead a uh, education program that teaches data science or advanced computing skills to astronomers to help prepare the astronomical community for the time when this telescope will be operating and like raining data on all of us. Um, so my day-to-day -day changes uh, pretty frequently. Uh, it's one of the things I like at the Adler. I'm kind of the equivalent of a professor where I do research on one half of my brain, my life, I don't know. Um, and then the other half of it is uh, education and public outreach. Um, so that could mean planning special events at the Adler. It could mean, um, you know, uh, like writing things um, for our blog or doing something um, like an interview with the media. Um, it could mean just going out and talking to the um, members of the public that come into the Adler. So I do basically a lot of communication. And actually the research side of my work is also a lot of communication. I think um, reading and writing is a big part of all of our jobs in um, big ways and small. Um, so, you know, whether it's emails or papers. Um, so that's a, a 
fairly big component of my work. Um, and I also travel from time to time. I get to do a lot of like public talks. And um, I'm starting a year-long position um, at the Library of Congress to do some research on the ethics of exploring Mars. So ask me about that later. And uh, yeah, I'll shut up for now and you can ask me questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, at some point, maybe not right now, I'll open up to questions, but um, maybe someone will ask. I'd love to get a little more information about the data science um, fellowship that you do. Uh, if we don't get a question, I'm going to ask you specifically, but let's, let's... Sure thing. Thank you. Let's open it up to questions from our um, group here. Uh, I'm going to take two questions from this room and students that's sitting with me, and then we'll try to go to the broader audience that's on YouTube and on Google Hangout, Hangouts. So who wants to ask? Yeah. Um, Introduce yourself okay. and then ask a question. Uh, my name is Candace Stoffer. I'm from Portland, Oregon at Portland State University and an RU student here. Um, and my question is actually for Leslie. I'm really curious about like what your job as an editor looks like and kind of the things you do to edit these papers that come into you that sounds really interesting to me okay so um basically every astronomy paper that's submitted to nature from anywhere in the world comes to me there's a few of the hard rock mars papers that i don't handle but everything else goes through me and then um i have to decide which ones look sufficiently interesting to go and, um, and send them out to referees, and I reject the rest. Typically, um, I reject about three quarters of the papers without uh, sending them to referees. And then I have to find referees, and, um, um, and uh, you know, just manage the whole process. And there's an awful lot of uh, what we call developmental editing, where you know if the paper is going forward, um, I can advise people on how to restructure the paper to communicate more effectively. Um, you know, as scientists, we're not taught how to write, and we follow the example in the literature, which is almost uniformly terrible. And um, there are certain principles, though, that I can help explain to people and I particularly like working with undergraduate or with graduate students and um, I get a lot of um, um, pre-submission inquiries from grad students often the, the first paper they write is a nature paper um, just because they found something interesting in their thesis and um, there was a case a couple of years ago a Yale student and I spent about two months uh, working with her and the paper got published in the end and she wrote me this really nice email um, after it was all over and she said that it was the most valuable experience of her grad career. So okay, any further questions, follow up? Um, so is there anything other, I guess, in your job that maybe wouldn't yeah, like something that we wouldn't expect an editor to do, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Are you just reading through papers, or what other like aspects are there of the job? Well, I I travel globally, and I give talks all over the place about how to publish a paper in Nature. Um, and I've also been invited to do some really cool things, like uh, at the first awarding of the Embart Sumian Prize in. Um, Yerevan, which was about six years ago now, I was invited to um, be awarded to some of my authors for work that was published in Nature's Exoplanet work. And so I was invited to speak about um, the, um, the impact the discovery of exoplanets has had on the general public. And then when I got, and I thought this was a fairly low key thing, and then I get to the auditorium and it's going out on live TV. I'm up there on the um, on stage with the president of Armenia. And we had a state dinner afterwards at the Armenian White House. It turned out to be a very big deal. 
and um, uh, and then I chaired, a, moderated a roundtable um, at Tharmus, a, con a, a science and music concert thing put together in 2011. And the people on the panels were Neil Armstrong, um, Alexei Leonov, um, George Smoot, Jack Sostak, um, uh, Bill Tarter, and Brian May, um, the, the guy who left grad school to found Queen. And then he went back and he finished his degree later. And I had to keep these guys talking for 180 minutes because it was in honor of Yuri Gagarin's first orbital um, trip. And that was, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. That's, that does sound like a lot of fun. Um, okay, let me open up to another question from someone else in our room. I think if there is one. Yeah. I have a question for Evgeny. Evgeny, yeah, so yeah. speak up a little and just introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Nicole. I'm from uh, New Jersey and I go to Rutgers University. Uh, my question to Evgeny um, is how has finding a job in the industry, like did you always want to do something in industry or was that just a, I guess a position that came to you, it just, you did it? <laughs> Sorry if I can't remember exactly. I surely did it, yeah. But uh, it's industry certainly was not my first choice. It, I came to in this direction organically by looking what I do, what, how my interests evolve. Uh, one thing that helps a lot is to know people in industry. There are many ways to get to know people. The best way, while well, you can get you through internships, just apply everywhere and see what you get. That's you get known, you get projects, out, not just in academia, but also outside academia, which keeps your options open. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun as well. Can be. What's your favorite part about the? In what's your favorite part about industry, and how is it different from doing something in academia? So, the great thing about industry is that, like, for a lot of companies, especially in tech companies, like Intel, Nvidia, it's pretty much like a postdoc, except it's better pay and permanent, until you get fired or quit, of course. And uh, you can do a lot of. I mean, there is, of course, things needs to be done, and what matters is just the company. But there are a lot of freedom that you can explore at the research level that potentially may or may not end up in a product, educate yourself, see what's interesting. There's a lot of leeway. And uh, so you can make it very, I mean, given this freedom, you can make it very good or make it very bad for yourself, depending how you approach it and what's your mindset. It's not academia for sure. I mean, one thing I do miss is exposure to all these interesting colloquies and presentations. So when I want to stay up to date with astronomy, I have to put conscious efforts to be there, and it's, you f I feel it. It's not come for free. Uh, but there's always trade-offs. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's go to a question from the broader audience. I see we have a question from Kaylee Fitzgerald, and her, um, maybe there's a few people online there, so please go ahead, Kaylee. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Kaylee. Uh, we're here. I have a Chelsea and a Ryan. Um, we're at Haystack Observatory uh, from MIT in Weston, West Ford, Massachusetts. Um, I go to Bunker Hill Community College in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, my question is for Regina and uh, Lucianne, in either of you guys, if you wanted to answer. Um, I'd just really like to hear about your experience um, with being a, or just what's been helpful at least for being a female in a STEM field is that, you know, going to conferences for just women or, you know, um, have you found, you know, having a higher degree more helpful or I'm just kind of like to speak to that experience. Um, and I hope that I'm not coming off as a loaded question. I really, I mean, it in, in, in a way that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested to hear about that. So, thanks. You want to go first, Regina, or should I? Go, go ahead. You can start if you want. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I uh, I 
think I've never like attended any like conferences that are specifically for like women in the sciences, um, although they do exist. So I can't really speak to that. But I can say that I have had the benefit of um, working with a lot of um, like female mentors. Um, and that wasn't actually, a, like I didn't really mean to do that. It sort of happened um, along the way. I, I had my first like taste of research um, when I was at the very end of high school. I got to do this like summer program um, where I worked with uh, a woman who was the head of a solid state physics lab um, at City College in New York, um, which is where I'm from. And like, you know, if astronomy is like doing a lot better um, in its gender equality than like physics is and specifically solid state physics. So at the time as a high school student, I had no idea how uncommon um, a like senior woman leading a lab was. Um, so it just sort of seemed, you know, when I look back now, uh, I think that experience was formative just because I saw like an example of someone. I was like, oh yes, obviously, like there are labs that are led by women. Um, so I think that had uh, had something to do with it. And then it's really just worked out um, that I've managed to meet uh, like my thesis advisor who um, was a woman and I worked with some other um, women on my thesis. But I've also worked with um, a number of very accomplished male advisors. Um, and I think that the the thing that I've always found productive um, is to you know surround yourself with people who are on your team um, and who are interested in encouraging you and helping you to figure out um, kind of what your best path forward is. Um, and that person can be of any gender. Um, you know, it's nice to have examples and it's definitely nice to like, um, you know, look around you and see other people like you in the room. Um, but I think in general, um, you know, just ha making sure that you're kind of doing quality control on like who has your attention, um, if that makes sense, uh, is kind of an important part of it. Because I think that um, productive mentors for me have come from all sides. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that that's just had a really positive impact on my career. Um, and it's not necessarily having female mentors. So I can jump in if you, um, if you want. I have a couple of things I can add. Um, so my experiences were, I actually was just thinking about it, I guess I had um, all entirely male mentors for, for my career. Um, and so I'd second that, that, you know, it's, the, it's not necessarily the gender of the mentor, it's kind of the quality of the mentor that's important, of course. But um, I will say I went to, as an undergrad, I went, was lucky enough to um, be somehow invited to one of these undergrad um, women in physics meetings. They happen now, I think, around the country in various places. So I would encourage you to look out for one of those meetings and try to go to those if you haven't, because um, they are fantastic and they, uh, at least, well, I did it long ago, but I, if it's the same, you know, it, it, uh, there's a lot of topics that are discussed, a lot of resources that are given, um, and just generally kind of a great way to make connections with people, to meet people. Um, and learn about resources. Um, and so a couple resources that I'll just mention there is, um, if you're not familiar with it yet, through the AAS, the American Astronomical Society, there is um, a committee on the status of women in astronomy and they do a lot of things. They have a newsletter, an email newsletter you can get um, sort of every other week or so. They have a lot of resources online about various topics. Um, and um, I'll just put in a plug. I, I don't know if I've actually been to, I don't think I have actually been to a women only meeting, like women in astronomy meeting, although I've, I've wanted to go, I just have never been able to make it happen. But um, actually next year um, in October of 2018, because it's the 200th birthday of Mariah Mitchell, we're actually organizing a Mariah Mitchell Women in Science meeting, which is gonna be multidisciplinary. It's gonna include both scientists and um, uh, people from literature who are interested in history of science. So sort of, it will be a very interesting um, two-day meeting that's going to happen in the Boston area. So I'll just put in a little plug to look out for that if you're if you're interested and you are able to make it. And we may have some uh, fellowships funding for students and whatnot. So that'll be in October 2018. Um, awesome. Thank one, you guys so much. Oh yeah. I have one quick thing. Um, 
So uh, that was a really good point that Regina made about the Committee on the Status of Women. Um, they also have a mailing list that, you know, posts articles and like interviews with like, people with different careers. And in addition, there's also a Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy, and they have a very good blog. Um, I don't think they actually have a mailing list, but they do keep a good blog, so, um, which is called Astronomy in Color. Um, so, you know, speaking not just to women, but to people who are underrepresented in the sciences in general, um, you know, if that describes you, feel free to look for that stuff. Um, and particularly for women of color, uh, there's also Vanguard STEM, um, which is a website run by Jedida Eisler, who is a black woman who studies um, AGN uh, at Vanderbilt, and she's really awesome, and they have a lot of interviews um, that are super helpful. Thank you, ladies, for answering that. Um, and I think that for now we're done with questions, mm -hmm. but I, I think we have somebody thinking about a question for a little later on. So, thank you. Uh, I wonder, Jesus. I wonder if you. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I wonder if you wanted to jump in to, for a similar kind of um, feedback of someone from, you know, obviously male, but from an underrepresented um, group. How your experience has been, and if you have anything you want to add. Well, first of all, yeah, I mean, I think they've, they've given a lot of good information. Um, again, I come up sort, of, sort of from a perspective more from the physics side, and as I think Lishana pointed out, the physics numbers are uh, very, very poor. Uh, so I believe it's at the faculty line, about 20% women and 5% total Native uh, uh, African American and Hispanic uh, across the country. So, so the numbers and uh, frankly, the numbers haven't changed in about 20 years. It's completely flat. Now, a lot of that has to do with academia changing, but a lot of it has to do that there are really difficult institutional um, impediments uh, in the way, uh, having to do with everything from the GRE score and how that's biased against both women and minorities, and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, one of the things that I have found that I think is uh, uh, maybe worth mentioning is that it is possible to have sort of a social justice conscious and do science. So, so it's not like, it's not like you can do, you know, it, when you do science, you abandon everything else in your life. Um, so it's been re really rewarding to me that I've been able to get involved in uh, issues of equity uh, and issues of representation and, and still do science. Um, so that, that's been a, a it, it's a little more work. Uh, it's a little, um, uh, perhaps there's, there's an unfair burden placed on folks who come from underrepresented groups and that you're expected to always represent. Uh, but that sort of comes with the territory a little bit. Um, but, but it is also very rewarding to see somebody who's from, for example, a tribal college um, in rural South Dakota or something, uh, um, uh, get turned on by native seeds and find out that there's value in the science that their culture always had and then see it sort of transform and, and see that person bloom. That, that's really, a, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's worth seeing that happen and, and somehow being involved with that. And at the same time, again, um, get to do your science. So, so um, it, Early in my career, frankly, it bothered me that I was seen as a minority scientist. That is, that uh, as as if my physics somehow um, was I don't want to say tainted, but um, it came with this extra dimension that other people perhaps didn't have to have. And now I kind of wear that badge uh, because, in fact, one of the strongest cases to be made for diversity is that folks from different cultural backgrounds bring different questions. Their, their creativity is formed differently because of their culture. And so, so, so yeah, I am a Mexican-American astrophysicist. And I, now I, I sort of wear that more comfortably than I did at one point. Thank you very much. Um, Let's go for another question from this room here, the Sierra group. Do we have another one? Yeah. So I have a question for Jesus. Jesus oh, yeah. So my name is Jose Flores. I'm from Cal Poly Pomona in California. Uh, and I have a question for Jesus. 
And uh, so I'm also interested someday in the future, probably being involved with uh, like social justice thing and whatnot. But is there a point where I should be maybe a high tenure professor where I can speak up? Or if I'm a postdoc somewhere, would I be like, maybe would that like not allow me to like get other postdocs because I'm spoken, I guess? Or how, how would I deal with that? Yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, um, I have a very good friend who's on faculty at Columbia uh, who is facing these issues now. Um, um, at some point, you have to be selfish. At some point, you kind of have to focus on your career, uh, focus on your science, focus on the kinds of things. If you're going into academia and the kinds of rewards um, that the institution, that your particular institution values, and every institution is a little bit different, uh, but let's say that you're at a research intensive university, then that re that university is going to value certain things. And um, it, it does, you don't do your community any good if you don't succeed in your career, right? So you, you have to make sure that you succeed in your career. Uh, so at some point you have to be selfish. At the same time, um, it's very difficult for somebody that came from my community not to, and, I'm sure it's true for many communities, but for my, I can only speak to, about my community in my life. Um, it's very difficult not to give back to that community because that's part of what my makeup. So, so it, it, it can be a difficult balance, and it's 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 a balance that um, that isn't always, uh, frankly, kept. Sometimes you can get out of balance. Uh, uh, but then you get back into balance. I mean, you develop a network of folks. Uh, hopefully, you, you'll build a community. One of the most effective strategies that you can have is, and I think somebody else has mentioned this, is you, you, you build a community around you that, that, that you know um, can help you in, when you face the particular issues that you're faced with. So if you're, faced, if you're from the Hispanic community, you know that, for example, living in your community is very difficult. It's especially difficult that, like, my sister went to MIT. We're from El Paso, Texas. It was very difficult for my parents to let her go. It was difficult for her to, to, to do that. And so, um, and it 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 doesn't do any good for someone to tell you that that's not a real thing. So 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 you need a community around you that says, yeah, that's a real thing. And here's how you here's how you handle that. Um, uh, so, so to, to your particular question as to when you get involved, um, yeah, I think the, the 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 standard answer is take care of yourself first and then get involved with your community. I find that answer incomplete um, because that's not maybe that's not who you are. If who you are is you have to get you sort of have to get involved in these other things, then you have to kind of get involved in these other things and work harder. <laughs> Can I offer a, a quick suggestion since you're in Pomona? Um, you might look up Jorge Moreno. Um, yeah. he, just, uh, he just moved to a position at Pomona College um, and uh, I'm sure would love to talk to you about this. Um, Jesus's advice obviously is great, but you can find examples of people who have decided to do social justice work with their science at different stages. Um, Chanda Prescott Weinstein is an example of a woman who is uh, very, very outspoken about social justice in the sciences and is a postdoc. Um, Jedida Eisler, also who I mentioned before. Um, Jorge and um, John Johnson at Harvard uh, co-run a center called the Banneker Azatlan um, Institute, which is specifically for students of color in astronomy. Um, and they, uh, they have both chosen to do that kind of activism at different stages. So you might look at the, some of these folks and see how they do it, um, in addition to heeding Jesus's very wise words. Yeah, uh, Jorge is actually my mentor. Uh, oh, perfect. <laughs> it's gonna be really easy for you to find him then. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let me go to a question from Marcel Howard. Are you still with us? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, hello, I'm Marcel Howard. I'm an undergrad at Case Western Reserve, but I go to an REU at Cornell. And my question is for Leslie. So Leslie, just how many crackpot papers do you get on a daily basis? Like how many papers that say like, 
Einstein, I have this great paper, I'm waiting for my Nobel Prize, but I need you to check this first. So like, just um, how many so, of those do you get? So I, I used to handle all of the physical science cranks. Um, that, that's no longer true. That was back in the, the old paper days. But I still, I still see them, you know, passing by. And some of them are assigned to me. Um, but it's probably um, every day there's one or two. Um, but, you know, it isn't just crackpots. Um, people get out of their own field and, and they think they can, uh, they, they think they know more than they do. For example, when I first joined Nature, I had a hundred page manuscript from a retired engineer at Rocket Dive. And his paper was all about the, um, the effects of, uh, in, in the sun on the energy budget if the sun was 1% uranium-235. And all of it was correct, but it was entirely irrelevant because the sun is not 1% uranium-235. Um, so often the, the physics is correct, or, you know, passingly so, but the, the underlying assumptions are, are wacky. Thank you. Uh, let's go to another question from this room, if we have one. Yeah, Ethan. Hi, uh, my name's Ethan. I'm a student here at Northwestern. Um, my question's for Gina. Um, could you please talk about that four year, four year gap you took and whether or not it was helpful in shaping your career? Yeah, certainly. So, um, and I had a lot of advice, by the way, I'll also say of people saying, uh, if you don't go straight to grad school, you're never going to go. Don't do it. Don't take time off. And um, I'll just put it out there that I think that's absolutely not true. And in, and in fact, I think time off, it depends, of course, on everybody's personality, but time off can often be a really good thing. Um, and I have known now lots of people who ended up taking time off to either work in industry for a little while um, or what I did. I actually was here at Maria Mitchell just kind of doing some research and helping out with the summer student um, program. And it gives you the ability to um, mature a little bit and become maybe get a better idea of what you actually want to do in graduate school because let's be honest graduate school is hard it's a lot of work and if you're kind of not sure about it it can it can you know it can be difficult so it's it's nice to be able to go into graduate school knowing that it's it's like a job basically and you know and to be able to treat it as a professional and and you know be very serious about it in that way um, sometimes it can be helpful for people to take time off. So what I, my particular case was that um, the year after um, my undergraduate, I got a Watson Fellowship, which is a, um, a fellowship that allows you to travel for a year internationally. And so I was outside of the US traveling on this fellowship and I wasn't able to apply for graduate school and sort of um, came back from that and didn't know what to do. And um, I had been an REU student here at Mariah Mitchell and so the then director invited me back to work as his assistant, uh, which I did. And that just kind of ended up turning into three years um, before I ended up going back to graduate school. But it, it allowed me in a way to um, sort of have a break from academics, from school, and focus on um, research, learning a bit more about research, and also maturing as a person and just getting uh, more skills under my belt. And I really think helped me once I started graduate school get through kind of the tough times of grad school and know what I wanted to do. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is coming from Rachel Bauer, who's with us on uh, Google Hangouts, Hangouts. But there's also, oh, was, uh, Regina, I think I might have seen you. Sorry if I cut you off. But let me, um, let me get back to Rachel. You had a question who's going to go for Lucianne. But I also see a question on YouTube who, um, from Bryce Cousins, which is similar for Lucienne and Regina, is saying um, if you can both talk about your research experience and really how much time do you have for research. So let me ask, let me, Rachel, please ask your question and then also Lucienne and Regina, please talk a little bit about how much time you have for research in your positions. Um, okay, so there's 
This is the um, REU group um, part at the Mariah Mitchell Association. Um, so we typed out the question to Lucian. Do you want me to read it aloud or? Um, yeah. could, so could you talk? Okay. Could you talk a little bit more about how you found yourself actually working at a planetarium and what sort of skills did you need that you didn't maybe learn in the classroom or didn't really expect to need? Sure. Um, so I found myself working at the Adler uh, in part because the job became available like when I was applying for jobs. So, um, you know, I was a, in the middle of my second postdoc, which is roughly around when you start thinking about applying for faculty jobs. And I did apply for a lot of sort of traditional um, university or college uh, jobs. But then this position at the Adler, um, which sort of swaps out classroom teaching for um, what we call informal education, which is like what we also call education and public outreach. Um, that came available at the same time. It's a relatively rare job just because um, the Adler is one of very few planetaria that have like a research department. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say um, I'll, I'll start with like a broader, a broader comment, which is that um, I think in general, uh, astronomy grad school and your subsequent postdocs are very good at imparting um, the information that you need via classes and uh, teaching you how to do research. Um, they actually don't teach you the vast majority of other skills that you need to be a successful scientist. So Leslie mentioned, for example, writing. Um, I would say public speaking is part of that. I would also say like mentoring students is part of that too. Um, you know, and like helping students become scientists themselves. All of that stuff is, you know, things that we don't necessarily get formal education in. Um, and, you know, add to that also like learning to code. Often you don't have like, at least, you know, at my and Aaron's generation and above, um, there weren't like formal coding classes in a lot of cases for people. Um, so there are a lot of aspects of any um, person's job kind of at the faculty level that they do that they don't necessarily have classroom teaching in. Um, probably the biggest example of this that comes into play in the pan planetarium um, is public communication. Um, so, you know, in, as astronomers, since we're professional scientists, we often refer to like the public, um, which glosses over the fact that um, the public is made up of individuals and all of those individuals have very different backgrounds. Um, they have different relationships to science and um, you know space specifically, but then also to um, like the patterns of thought that we take for granted that we learn uh, in our science educations. Um, and they also just have different cultural backgrounds as well. We get uh, you know you would think that you would only get people who are super into science in a planetarium, but the reality is that it's a tourist attraction, and a lot of people end up in here because we're another museum. Um, and so, yeah, you do get people who like know a lot about science, but then you also just get people who are, um, you know, in the planetarium because they like did all the other tourist things in Chicago. So I would say that um, one of the things that I've learned most being at the Adler is um, how to do conversational um, communication about science with people. So rather than presenting a public talk, um, being able to kind of meet people where they are and figure out like what it is that they want to hear about instead of what it is I want to tell them. Because um, if you're giving a talk, you're, you're doing all this one-way communication, um, but people come in with questions, but they also come in with like a lot of emotional baggage about like whether they should ask those questions or whether those questions will make them sound stupid. And like it can be kind of a trick to um, get out of people what they want to hear about and then to communicate it to them and with them um, in a way that is like appropriate for where they're coming to and like helps them understand some of the complex stuff um, by starting out, you know, maybe simple or maybe like ramping it up. And, you know, you can end up addressing a room that is like everybody from like two year olds to like 80 year olds. And there's, you know, like a person who thinks evolution doesn't exist and then like a person who like has a printed out copy of the New York Times science section and wants to ask you a super specific question. And then like a two year old um, that doesn't want to talk to you, but wants to touch everything in the room. And like, you know, it can be mayhem, um, but dealing with those situations is uh, probably the thing that I've learned to do the best um, since uh, being here. And Lucien, can you talk, and then Regina next, can you talk a little bit about how much time you have for research? 
Oh, yeah. Um, I would say also that, uh, and this is, again, a broader comment that doesn't have to do with being at a planetarium, that um, something that I didn't understand when I was a, an undergrad is that, like, once you get to the faculty level, like, you are not spending as much hands-on time doing research as you are when you are younger. Like, um, when you're a grad student and a postdoc, you spend all your time doing your research um, for the most part. But then as you like move kind of beyond that, um, a lot of your time is spent like working with students and helping like along a like mutual research project. So um, I actually, <laughs> sadly, like I kind of miss coding as much as I used to, um, but I spend a fair amount of time like talking with my graduate student. I have a um, student from the Illinois Institute of Technology who's doing his thesis with me. Um, and so like we work together on the project that I had been working on when I was a postdoc and now you know we're working together and he's like making the code even more amazing and stuff. Um, so the nature of like what you call research and what you spend time on doing research also changes as you move beyond. Um, but also just like being at um, like a person that does a lot of things, like the thing that goes in that research chunk of my time also changes from day to day. Um, so, you know, any time from like zero to 100% of my time on a given day, um, but usually like less like hands-on time and more like working with students to accomplish things, if that makes sense. Thank you. Regina, do you want to add on how much you do? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, so the first answer would probably be about 50-50, but it depends. In my particular job, it's heavily dependent on the time of year. Um, and um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, yeah, I was before I started in this position, I was a professor at a small liberal arts university. So I also had that experience that you're, you know, you're right. You're when you, if you stay in an academic track and become a professor somewhere, a lot of your time is going to go towards teaching. And especially at the beginning, preparing, you know, lectures and labs and doing all of that associated classroom stuff. But you're also expected to still do research. Even nowadays at small liberal arts universities, um, it is an expectation that professors work with the undergraduate students doing research. Um, it just so happens that I really enjoy that. And actually, that was one of the things I learned um, being in that position was that I really liked working with the undergrad students. Um, but I would say it's a it is, it's kind of a constant struggle to balance, you know, research with everything else that you have to do. And I generally try to keep it sort of 50, 50. Um, but again, you know, it, it depends just day to day. Sometimes, you know, you, you have to write a report or, um, I write pay, um, articles for the local newspaper now, or I have to do some public outreach event or something. And so a lot of time goes to that for, for a day or two, and then you can hopefully get back into doing normal sort of research activities. So, you know, I would say at least in this particular job and the ones I've had before, it kind of varies day to day, but actually for me personally, that's something that I really like because no day is ever exactly the same, you know, and I find that quite interesting. So I think it's sort of a process of figuring out how you in particular work and what you really like to do. And, and maybe some of you, you know, we'll find out that you actually don't really like research so much and you maybe are going to gravitate more towards um, an outreach position or a strictly um, technical position. Um, but I think I'll just stop there. It's great that you guys are all doing these kinds of things because that's part of the process of learning how you work and what you like. Thank you. Uh, I want to recognize that we're at about three o'clock central time, which is when we had originally said we were going to end, although we started a little late. So I'm willing to go for another few minutes. But if the panelists need to leave, that is quite all right. Um, Lucy, I'm good for like another 20 or so. Perfect, because I wanted to ask you, uh, building off of your answer before, um, you were talking about how you learned some of the skills on the job and how, you know, in our generation, we weren't really taught, for instance, coding. Um, but this may be a good time for you to tell us a little bit more about the data science fellows, fellowship program that you run. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a, a program we started, um, well, I started thinking about it about three years ago and it really got off the ground um, about a year and a half ago. Um, and it's actually jointly run with um, Sierra. So uh, my postdoc, Adam Miller, who works on it, um, some of you might have interacted with. Um, uh, so basically the the problem that we were trying to solve is this um, this 
telescope that I'm working on that's being constructed, LSST or the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, is going to produce a massive amount of data. Um, over 10 years, it'll produce you know a few petabytes of data. And that's um, data that is available generally to um, the entire US and Chilean communities and to a number of international like contributors um, as well. So it's going to be serving a very, very large fraction of um, the astronomical community. But for the most part, um, you know, like certainly when I was an undergrad, uh, I learned to program because my uh, advisor wanted a program that would like take um, the spectra from uh, the, the Sloan survey um, and just like automatically type them. So he handed me like a, a like ha IDL intro handbook and was just like, we need a program that does this. Here's like the, the manual. I don't write in this language, like figure it out. And I was like, um, so that's kind of like how I learned to code. Um, and the, the analogy that I always give is this, like, yeah, if somebody gave you like a hammer and a nail and some nails and like a bunch of wood, you could probably like build something with it. But like, you know, the, the chair or the boat or whatever it is that you built would probably not be the best chair or boat ever built. <laughs> Um, so while you can figure it out, uh, if you want to make people empowered um, to use large amounts of data in a way that is efficient um, and that helps them extract science early, often, um, and in the best possible way, some training um, would be helpful. So uh, the problem is that like most astronomy graduate programs have like pretty fixed curricula and students are trying to learn the astronomy stuff um, at the same time. So we created this program um, that is two years long and it's six week long sessions over two years. And our students come from all over the place um, and we bring them to, uh, the, the workshop moves around. So we bring them to the institution that it's at and we focus on teaching them to do something in the realm of what's called data science, which is generally like statistics, um, you know, handling databases, data management, how to write code efficiently, um, machine learning, which is like helping, um, well, ask me what machine learning is if you want to know more about that. Um, so, you know, we teach them these suite of tools that they can then use. And um, together, uh, Adam and I have been developing this curriculum that is open, it is free to use. Um, it's freely available on a website called GitHub, and I can send that around if you want to look at it. And the idea is to help spread these skills um, throughout the community. So while we only we, our first class was 15 students, now we have 30. That's not a huge fraction of the astronomical community, but the idea is to make um, these sort of super users that are seated throughout um, and then distribute the uh, teaching materials really openly so that people can get to them. And our hope is to sort of quickly build up a community of people that um, use these kinds of tools to do their research and help empower other people to learn to do that too. Great, thank you very much. Um, Evgeny, if you're willing to stick around, I have one more question that is coming from the YouTube channel uh, from Locke Patton, who wants to know how useful was it having a PhD going into industry? Sure, I can stick around. You wanna ask now? Yeah, please, uh, how, useful, how useful is your PhD? I would say it's actually was quite useful, and I would go further and say a postdoc was actually quite useful. I used to think that some of my colleagues who left after PhD did a smarter job. They probably did. But the experience, again, with a postdoc was certainly was beneficial to what I do. Mostly because my second postdoc was, what are the more postdoc was, on an entirely different topic than my PhD. So it has a brand new experience. So it simply helped. One of the things I like about PhD, it's, it teaches you how to think critically and how to find out what you need efficiently because there's, there's too much literature. So when you go to industry, this is a very good skill to have. And when you don't know how to do, you need to investigate topics, think differently. The skills I got from PhD was certainly helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I, if you're all willing, I'll take one more final question maybe from this room. And Sierra, anyone? Okay, Candace. All right, so none of us are doing this for money, obviously, but uh, like a lot of my engineering friends always talk so much smack about how 
you know, we're never going to make any money because we're physicists. So how difficult would you say that it is to, like, um, how difficult is it to find a job that is able to support your lifestyle and gives you a comfortable standard of living? Like, is it very difficult with a PhD to find a good job? I can chip in one thing that even as an engineer, it is not guaranteed you're going to get the job that will sustain your quality of living. So engineering is not a silver bullet. It's helpful, though. I mean, the the thing is, is that like a PhD opens a lot of doors. Um, it's useful in the sense that Evgeny said it a moment ago, that it teaches you patterns of thinkings and, and thinking and behaviors that can make you um, a really big asset to industry jobs. But it also is sort of like a, a smart person merit badge. Like it, it's even if you're doing some job that um, doesn't directly draw on like your astronomy training, um, people look at a PhD and they do see that you sunk a fair amount of your time um, in dedicating yourself to something that is very challenging to do um, and that requires you know being detail oriented and being organized. Um, in addition to you know taking in and processing and synthesizing lots of information, so it's not a silver bullet, um, but it does make you att more attractive. Um, it also depends on like the kind of job that you want to do. So um, you know, if if what you want to do is like become a faculty astronomer, those jobs are relatively rare. Um, they're they're still you know there might seem like there's a lot of faculty around, but it can be hard to get an academic job. Um, you know, if you get that, then sure it draws directly on your your PhD. But there are a lot of other options. Um, you know, like working at undergrad focused institutions, being at places like where Regina is at, um, being at a NASA lab, even going into industry. So you know it. No, nothing in the entire world can guarantee that you will get a job. <laughs> nothing. Um, but it certainly doesn't, uh, in most cases, it doesn't hurt. So I think there are pretty good numbers. You can go to AIP.org and you can look at the numbers there. And I think you'll see that physics and astronomy undergraduate degrees are fairly competitive with engineering degrees in terms of, of, um, of salaries. Um, I think uh, Lucian is right about, uh, or she hit the mark, which is talks about um, how much money you make, make is going to depend on what you're willing uh, to do. So, for example, uh, my sister, the, the one that went to um, MIT, she's actually this uh, CTO at a hedge fund. So she has all these quants that work for her. They're called quants. They, these are typically PhDs in physics and, and mathematics. And, and, and those guys make a lot of money. They make a good living. Um, it's a high stress job. Um, and you know, you're working on a fairly limited sort of in a very sort of limited focus and you don't have a lot of, uh, freedom to talk about your work and so forth. I'm in a faculty position. Uh, I don't make nearly as much money as either she or the people that work for her. Uh, but I have a great deal of freedom to do, um, all kinds of things, especially once one gets tenure, um, you you have the, the freedom to do all kinds of things that um, I you couldn't pay me enough money not to do. Um, so 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 for example, I, I have a friend who is in the philosophy department here, and he and I work on some it's real research. He, he comes at it from philosophy. I come at it from cosmology on things about having to do with the beginning of the universe and so forth. And I the way I'm built, that's really, really more valuable than than m making twice or three times the amount of money, although making twice or three times the amount of money would be nice. Um, that, that, uh, so, so, so I'm compensated exactly where I kind of need to be. Um, I, 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 I'm not starving. I get to travel. One of the things about science is you do get to travel, um, and it's not on your dime, typically. I just got back from Santiago, Chile for the SDSS from the SDSS collaboration meeting. Um, so, so, you know, I spent uh, a week down in, in Santiago. Um, so, so I get to travel and, 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 and um, I, I think you have to ask yourself what, what it is you really want, um, uh, how you see yourself spending your lifetime. Um, so I, I will also say, and I think Lucian mentioned this, um, 
faculty jobs are are hard to get and they're getting harder to get. Uh, the act, the academy is changing. I, I, I don't know how it's going to change. Um, I've seen some really dire predictions about the academy with the tenure system going away and uh, all kinds of things. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to the academy. So, so um, and unfortunately, most of our undergraduate training and graduate programs are really geared to get students into faculty. And I think our undergraduate and, and graduate programs need to face the reality that those jobs aren't there anymore and that we need to sort of restructure and we're doing it in my department here. We need to restructure or, or at least add different trajectories for students that are that are not going to go on either to graduate school or in eventually out to faculty positions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just take a moment to see if any of the panelists want to weigh in on that at all. Okay, and with that, I think I'm going to thank all of you for joining us. Maybe we'll give a round of applause on this end. <laughs> Thanks for all the great questions. Thanks to our panelists, and we'll see you next year. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>